Now on BBC One Northern Ireland, 29 Live with John Kelly. Hello and welcome to 29 Live. Tonight we look at five years of the Cultural Traditions Group. What exactly are they trying to do and are they getting anywhere? We'll have our own cultural collision as the bagpipes meet the Illan pipes and, bad news for goats, the boron meets the lamb bag. Two architects take the plunge of the Ormo baths and we look at laveries, the paintings that is, and hear what two leading contemporary artists, T.P. Flanagan and Ross Wilson, think of Sir John's work. But the main theme of tonight is division and diversity. Five years ago, the Cultural Traditions Group was set up to promote mutual understanding. They were full of ideals, full of vision, and now it would appear they're full of money as well. Five years on, what have they achieved, and how important are issues of identity and culture to the many problems of Northern Ireland? With me is Morna Crozier, Development Officer with the Cultural Traditions Group, Paul Burgess, who's just published his first book on Northern Ireland, Crisis and Conscience, and Paul Sweeney, Director of the Northern Ireland Voluntary Trust. Morna, first of all, and to set this up for the few people around who don't know what cultural tradition is about, the few people around who haven't asked you for money yet either. Um, what exactly for you is at the heart of cultural traditions? I think what's at the heart of the cultural traditions programme, and of course it's not just where I work in the Community Relations Council, it's in other places as well, is the uh, chance, the opportunity for people to look at those things that are really important to them, about their identity, about their culture and about their traditions. And I think the cultural traditions programme has offered people that opportunity. The other thing I think is that the expression, however many people don't know about it, is now fairly common currency. And uh, I think that's a very good thing. There are lots of people who are doing cultural traditions who wouldn't describe themselves or have done so in the past as being people who looked at division or diversity. And cultural traditions now means that, I think. Before we get into the, some of the specifics you mentioned there, what is it exactly that you do? Because you're, you're known for giving money to people. Yeah, well, that's part of it. Um, there are several programs, and those are the programs that give people money, and they support community groups mostly, give them the opportunity to do the things that they want to do. This may be a local history project, it may be community arts, but I think one of the things about cultural traditions is that it's much broader than the arts. A lot of people are interested in looking at history, that's true. A lot of people are also looking at women's history, at the rural background, at work history. And it's two words, it's culture and traditions, not just those things which people have inherited, either from their families, from their communities, but also it's how they're looking at those things now. And culture, of course, is a very changing concept. So since the cultural traditions program is reactive, we are reacting to what people want to do, what they're interested in doing. We're also able then to support them in new approaches, new things that are, as it were, looking at the future. It's not just retrospective, not stultified. Okay, Paul, you work with the NIVT, involved in a lot of uh, community work. What do you think the Cultural Traditions Group has achieved? Well, I think the important thing is, John, if you look at the policy, for example, in Northern Ireland, though, the official government policy is to give equal recognition to the two traditions in Northern Ireland. And consider, if you will, the Secretary of State's speech in Coleraine, the cultural and identity speech before Christmas. I mean, think how fundamentally different Northern Ireland could have been if, for example, Terence O'Neill could have made that speech, you know, 23 years ago. So it now is recognised that there are two traditions, the Irish nationalist tradition and the unionist tradition. For me, the Cultural Traditions Programme has put in place an expression of that policy. And it challenges everyone in Northern Ireland, groups and individuals, to contribute towards the diversity of the society that we now have. Do you think there was any impact? Now, we'll get into that whole political area later and the fact that it is a government sort of, in a way, sponsored idea. But uh, do you think any impact has been made on the ground, though? The actual work and the aims of the Cultural Traditions Group are fine, but have they had any actual impact on the sort of groups that you work with? Yes. Well, obviously, the NIVT in particular is working with local community groups. And I have to say that many of those groups feel so extremely excluded from the mainstream of society. Uh, so it's going to be very, very difficult for those groups to tie into a debate such as this because they do, as I say, feel so excluded. But the cultural traditions challenge is to every single institution and organisation and here in this society. I mean, sectarianism can be found at every single level. And so we need to be working at a whole series of different levels at different times. OK. Paul Burgess, Cultural Traditions Group, doing a good job. Well, I mean, I think cultural traditions work is vitally important. It's, a, it's an important prerequisite to, to building community confidence and ultimately community relations. But in my work as, as um, uh, a 
formerly a community relations officer for local government and also now with the Independent Commission of Inquiry Initiative 92 and also through some of the research I, I carried out from my book. Predominantly my finding is from the grassroots uh, areas, from the areas where perhaps arguably the work should be being done. Um, uh, predominantly there is a feeling that, that this is an initiative that is by middle class people for middle class people. Um, I think the reality is it throws up very real questions about the nature of culture within working class areas. Um, for example, uh, my finding has been, people are telling me is, in reality, uh, culture, contemporary culture in Northern Ireland is more Americanized, more contemporary than people might think. For example, uh, you know, a lot of people I'm speaking to, Inspector Morse or the semi-final of the FA Cup or a satellite dish is arguably more, more valid and more important to them than a, a colourful um, um, coffee table brochure on, on uh, Irish tapestry. Um, in fact, it might even be argued that um, um, uh, Linfield FC, the football club, um, signing uh, a Catholic from from Dundalk, um, exclusively, obviously, a uh, predominantly Protestant club, uh, means more to these people in a cultural identity sense than, than, than some of the projects, I think, that are, that are being carried out and some of the, the, the uh, um, exhibitions, uh, phot phot photography exhibitions, so on and so forth. Okay, Morna, let's get into some of these criticisms then. The first one, the most obvious one and the one that's always voiced, the chattering classes. You're all academics talking to each other. Yeah, well, that is the most common one. I, uh, there's a certain irony about it, I think. Uh, I don't think that most of the, say, 200-odd groups that have been funded on the Cultural Traditions Programme would actually define themselves as middle class. I suppose perhaps that that's the first one. The second thing is I think it actually goes back to the start of the Cultural Traditions Movement and to the three conferences which kicked the thing off, the first one that kicked it off in 1988. Now, the last conference was in, the, in 1990, and actually the Cultural Traditions Group hasn't run any conferences sil since then, though it has supported other people who have, as it were, been finding places to debate wherever they were, uh, chose to do it. I think the irony is, as Paul said earlier on, that in fact the middle classes are probably, if you're going to identify one social group who are not identifying um, the questions thrown up by cultural diversity, it is the middle classes. And as he said, there's just as much to d need to debate division and diversity and its implications cultural or otherwise. What about the academic classes though? People in universities who talk to each other about most subjects really are very often as little bearing on other people. Well I think perhaps that one of the things the Cultural Traditions Program has tried to do and academics would be a very small part of this is to try and draw together experts and amateurs and different sorts of people. I mean it works both inter and intra communities and a lot of the opportunity that we're offering people are opportunities to get in touch with whatever sort of expertise they need. Now that might be academic, it might be professional, it might be a writer's group wanting to have a creative writer with them, it might be somebody in the visual arts wanting to work, uh, to work at workshops using a sort of a practicing visual artist. So I think it's always a question of bringing groups together. The academics would be one group who were brought, as it were, to share their expertise, but only one of them. Okay, that criticism will remain, though, no matter what you say. That's the one that will stick, I'd imagine. Paul, I don't that necessarily see that it has to be a criticism. Okay. After all, academics debate things which other people find often very difficult. And if they can spread their debate into wider circles, I mean, why should that necessarily be a bad thing? Okay. Paul, the debate itself, mm -hmm. is that in any way a dangerous thing? Because our, this whole talk about identity and things, I never hear people in bars or anything or anywhere I go talking about my cultural identity. Is there any danger of actually talking about these things as simply reinforcing the problems that we already have? No, I actually totally disagree. I take the view that identity is at the very heart of, of the Northern Ireland problem. Um, in the community that I grew up in, if you like an Irish nationalist community, identity is important when it's denied to you or it's in some way suppressed. Or, for example, if the Protestant community now perceives itself to be under threat, or in some way they feel that their Protestant identity or ascendancy is under threat, then identity becomes you know, very, very important. And for me, as I say, it's very much at the heart. Now, if you've achieved your identity through self-confidence and self-esteem, and you choose then to throw it away, or you choose to be ambivalent or indifferent, that's fine. But in the most deprived communities, in the most vulnerable communities, identity and the sense of community and the sense of you know, where they've been, their roots, where they're going. This is very, very important. Paul, are we getting locked into a situation where we are reinforcing the, the stereotypes even? Well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to have to disagree with the other guests. And oh, I don't mean, be I, sorry I, about that. Well, no, I disagree. Um, I mean, I... Uh, you know, sort of I, I would be inclined to, to your opinion. Um, 
to a certain extent. A question, not an opinion. question, not an opinion. Far be it for me to express uh, an opinion. Uh, basically, I mean, I don't think it is as cut and dried as, as, as Paul has said. I mean, I think there's some validity in what he says. But uh, another side that's really ne very never, uh, never rarely addressed and actually underwrites what the Community Relations Council do generally, and more specifically the Cultural Traditions Group, um, is, is based on, on, if you like, uh, information, uh, information about the other community, information about the other community's identity, so on and so forth, and, and almost some kind of supposition that information will in some way down the line lead to reconciliation, greater information. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think um, um, one good example of, of where this hasn't worked or was in danger of falling down and educationists are, be are beginning to, to recognise this is in the whole education from mutual understanding and cultural heritage programme in schools. Now because there was no legislation uh, passed through at the time that there would have to be a necessary uh, inter-schools contact. It was quite feasible to carry out these classes on the syllabus, if you like, from the front of the classroom, where the children never had a, a necessity to meet anyone else from another school from the other side. Now, the reality is there, it's quite possible to take up your point that, number one, you're, you're actually um, um, reinforcing the stereotypes. Number two, arguably, you could, you could be turning out, in the worst case scenario, better educated bigots who now know uh, why they hate the other side. You give them the information, it's no longer a knee-jerk reaction. Right, Paul. Better educated bigots. There's one thing we better raise here at this point. £350,000, I think it was last year, most of this government money. Now, this was touched on earlier on, Morna. Government money, that immediately leads to the possibility of uh, compromise, manipulation, and even, as was suggested, social engineering. Now, that's a fairly sinister charge. How do you respond to that? Um, well, I think most of the cultural traditions programmes are educational now in the widest possible sense. Um, I don't think I would agree with Paul. I, I think you're talking as if a cultural traditions programme was aiming at a product. Cultural traditions programmes are mostly process and they're offering people opportunities to choose from that knowledge. Um, that You're not prescribing what choices they make. But I the think government does have an idea though. It, it, it does wish to educate people in a certain way, doesn't it? Well, I don't think you can educate people in a certain way. You're offering them the widest opportunity of what they want to look at the, themselves. The I mean, it is a reactive programme. There is not a hidden agenda. We are reacting to what people want to do. We're not setting, as it were, targets ourselves, which require people to have so many people doing a, an arts program, so many people doing a history project, whatever well, it may is be. Is social well, engineering it's, it's, too strong it's a term? Na it's naive and extreme to, to assume that the, the government are not players in this. The government are, you know, the government are players. They're not mm -hmm. objective in, in, the in the sense that we would understand. I mean, I think the whole community relations uh, initiative, the whole community relations reconciliation industry, if you like, that has come to be known in Northern Ireland, I mean, very much smacks of a very English uh, perception of, of, of what community relations should be. It's a home county thing. It's almost a colonial thing in the sense that if these tribes would just be nicer to each other in some way, uh, you know, and there's a pacifying element going on there. If these tribes would be nicer to each other, then, you know, maybe things would settle down. Now, the reality is there that the government are, are abdicating the responsibility to find a political solution. I think we really have to challenge that one. I mean, it's not just government. The people on the throughout the whole of Northern Ireland, not just even the whole of Northern Ireland, the whole of Western Europe are now working through programmes very similar to the Cultural Traditions programme here. And also, of course, it's not just government money. I mean, there are other people who regard this work as su sufficiently important to them to put their own enthusiasms, their own initiative, their own drive into it. Who evaluates it more? Well, most well, people evaluate what they're doing themselves, and if they do it again, they've worked, they reckon it's worthwhile. Very, very That's quickly, Paul, in a situation where people are still killing each other here, can the Cultural Traditions Group do anything? Well, you can pray or you can hope that Northern Ireland will sort itself out. You begin with one small step, and I think the Cultural Traditions Movement is a step in the right direction. The sum of money involved, minuscule compared to the millions we spend in keeping this war going. OK, Paul. Paul Sweeney, Morna Crozier, Paul Burgess, thanks very much. We could go on all night, I know. Now for a near-perfect bit of cultural crossbreeding. This may not be for those of you with sensitive ears, but the culturally sensitive will be well aware of its significance. Last year, the Different Drums Project in Derry set itself quite a challenge to bring together the drums of two different traditions, the Lambeg and the Boron. 29 Live commissioned the Different Drums Group to do a piece specially for this programme. It's based on Japanese Kodo drumming, and it's called Heartbeat. So here they are, Different Drums. I heard a wise woman say, the drum is the heartbeat of our nations. Listen to my heartbeat. 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 